Well, which of these paints look better in your walls? Which one? The, the one that says no prep, no prime formula? Or oh, this one says uh, for amazing color and flawless finish? Do either of these paints actually do what they say they do? How do you even know there's really paint in those cans? The fact is, you, you won't know the answer to either of those questions until you actually apply the paint. Paint's not made to stay in a can. The purpose of paint is revealed in its application. Your, your faith is kind of like paint. The genuineness and the effectiveness of your faith in Christ is only revealed once it is applied in daily life. Well, we've seen over the last few weeks that we're in this daily life and death battle. It's a spiritual battle. And 1 Peter chapter 5 says that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That someone is you. <laughs> He's seeking to devour you. And so the easiest person to devour is the one who either doesn't know he's in a spiritual battle or just doesn't take his enemy seriously. So let's get serious. Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. It's on page 479, excuse me, 979 in those black Bibles underneath the chairs. Please follow along at 979, Ephesians chapter 6. So we've seen that Ephesians chapter 6 offers six pieces of God's spiritual armor given to every believer for spiritual battle. So God, in his grace, has given us everything we need, not just to eke by and to survive, but to thrive as we live out our new life in Christ in this broken world, even then as the world is held captive by God's enemies. So God's word teaches us, and God's spirit empowers us to use the armor of God effectively. Well, we saw that fastening the belt of truth means taking hold of God's truth, and inviting it to take hold of us. And then the truth of the gospel, as it takes hold of us, it glorifies God by transforming us into people who love and who live the truth. That's a belt of truth. Well, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, we saw, means putting on Christ's righteousness given to us by grace. That's a gift. It's credited to us as a gift. So it's given to us by grace and grown in us by faith. So the breastplate of righteousness guards our thoughts and keeps our feelings in perspective throughout the spiritual battles of life. Well, the gospel of peace then fits our feet with readiness to stand firm in Christ every day that we learn to love, live, and, uh, I'm sorry, that we, we learn and, and live and love this gospel of peace. So this morning, Lord willing, we'll see that uh, the shield of faith can guard us in times of drought, doubt, and despair. Times of doubt, drought, and despair. Let's pray as we open God's word together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's life to us. Thank you, God, that uh, of your own word you brought us, of your own uh, will you brought us forth by the word of truth. So God, bring forth life in us. God, make this light, new life in Christ just spring up in us. Give us joy. God, give us rest in who you are and all you've accomplished in our place that you would be glorified as we see you as you are. And we see ourselves in light of your holiness. And, God, we, and, and then we long to turn from our sin and run to you in your righteousness. So God, thank you that Christ is our righteousness by faith. God, I ask that you would receive this. It's my, my offering of worship to you this morning. Uh, God, as it's uh, benefited me and my growth in Christ throughout the week to study and pray and prepare, God, I ask that for your glory, it would also benefit these precious people in this room right now who are part of the church family that I get to be a part of by your grace. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, <laughs> it's a delight to be your pastor. Thank you for this privilege and this joy. I can't believe I get to do this. Let's read God's word. This is Ephesians chapter 6. We'll read verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, 
that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. I'm going to stop there and ask, have you ever experienced... Seasons of spiritual doubt, spiritual drought, or maybe real despair. What if God gave you a shield that could guard you in those difficult times? Well, this morning we'll see that the, what the Bible means by shield, because he's given us a shield of faith. So we'll, we'll see what the Bible means by shield what the Bible means by faith, and then how this shield of faith can really can guard us in times of spiritual doubt, drought, and despair. Well, in the Old Testament, a shield is often serve, served as a, a metaphor, a picture of God's protection of his people. Genesis 15 has this account of God saying to Abraham, Abram, at the time, fear not, for I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Well, in Psalm 18, we know that the warrior king, David, he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God. He's my refuge, my shield. Later in that same Psalm 18, he says, This, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. So the Old Testament presents God as the protector of his people. He, the Lord is a shield for those who take refuge in him. Are you taking refuge in the Lord each day? Well, the word for shield used here in Ephesians chapter 6 referred to a large shield. It's like two and a half feet wide, about four feet tall. Picture like a little door. So it had a wood frame. It was covered with leather. It was tacked onto it. And then it was soaked in water so that... Uh, flaming arrows from the enemy would be able to be extinguished by hitting this, this damp, this wet leather shield. And so then, uh, and then moving in, in uh, unison, they would help shield one another by being in a, um, uh, in a group. So picture like this, you've seen a, a desert with the solar panels lined up, kind of like that. They're all protected together, they're protecting each other. So that, that's the shield pictured here, not a little round Captain America shield, but the great big shield like a door. So the soldier then, to use this thing must be on the lookout, must raise up this shield in order for it to be effective in protecting the other pieces of armor, which we know are directly against the believer's body, the soldier's body. But, but the shield is out here, protecting those other pieces of armor. So that's the shield. So, so what about faith? Well, just as a shield guarded the life of the first century soldier, the shield of faith is our faith in God that guards us through the spiritual battles of the Christian life. Now, we've seen this. Over the last several months in Ephesians, we've seen the word faith used throughout Ephesians in various contexts. So Ephesians first addressed faithful Christians in the first century city of Ephesus. Remember early on, Paul thanks God for the Ephesian church because he's heard about their faith. And he's heard about their, their, their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love toward all the saints, that is, all the people of God. So think of what's happening there. They have faith in God that's being demonstrated you might say, applied in love for God's people. So, in chapter 2 then, as we walk through Ephesians, we saw that a person is saved by grace through faith, not by the person's own doing, not by their own works. And then when, there's a prayer in Ephesians 1 and 3. We went through Ephesians 1 during pastoral prayer. Faith is the means by which those things are received. And so faith is a, is a key piece of the puzzle walking throughout Ephesians. Chapter 4 then speaks of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, as it speaks of the unity of the people of God in Christ. So here in chapter 6, the faith is the shield that God gives to his people to protect us on the spiritual battlefield of life. So God's word defines faith this way in Hebrews 11. It says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
So biblical faith is not like hoping for a new bike on your birthday because you see a gift wrapped that looks like a bike. <laughs> biblical faith means living in confident assurance that the unseen God will fulfill his promises to his people. That's biblical faith. So practically speaking, faith in action is our reasonable response to something or someone that we believe is worthy of our trust. Do you trust God? So for example, I'm sure you've heard this before, people use this all the time. You had faith in that chair you're sitting on. You had faith that it would hold you up. You walked in this morning and you had faith that, so in the chair and you sat on it. You're demonstrating faith. That's your faith in action. Either you remember, oh, this is my seat. It's my assigned seat, pastor. This is where I always sit. And so I know it's going to hold me up. Or you walked in and you thought, oh, look at all these people sitting on chairs. This one will probably hold up me too. So for whatever reason, you put that belief, that faith in action, and you sat on the chair. In action is demonstrating that we believe that God is worthy of our trust. That's, that's Christian faith in action. Think of this armor. None of us would bother putting on the belt of truth or the breastplate of righteousness or the shoes of readiness given by the gospel of peace if it wasn't for our faith. Putting on the whole armor of God, as God's word commands every Christian to do, that's our faith in action. It's demonstrating that we believe that God really is worthy of our trust, that he's able to protect us. And we'll run to him as our refuge. So, so the shield of faith, it, if, if you read carefully, it's not put on like a belt or the breastplate or the shoes, but it's, it's taken up. So, so taking up the shield of faith takes effort. You don't just put it on and strap it on and just forget about it. Taking up the shield of faith takes effort. And, and to use it effectively, it takes training and it takes practice. So verse 16, as we read, it's, it tells Christians to take up the shield of faith, which, which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Well, the word darts is translated uh, arrows in some of, your, some of your English translations. So first century soldiers, as I mentioned earlier, they would soak their shields in water in order to extinguish the flaming darts or arrows. Think about this. You can imagine that, that the soldier might be tempted to kind of skimp and use one of those little misters that, at the haircut place, kind of mist his shield, like, oh, it's good, we're good. I don't want it to get too heavy. I'm going to be on the battlefield for a while. I, I'll just kind of spritz it. Is it wet? Oh, yeah, it's wet. Captain, it's wet. You can imagine him doing that. Or you can imagine some guy just soaking it and then just going, oh, my goodness, this thing's so heavy, I can't believe this thing. So, so there'd be some temptation to compromise and not really take on the full equipping that the, the leader of the army, the general, would intend. But neither soldier would be truly ready then for the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, this word, you can, I want to point this out, the shield of faith is something with which you can extinguish the darts. So the Greek word translated in English as you can, or you're able to, is dunamai. It's a, the word we get dynamite from. So the idea in it is, is power outside of ourselves. You don't ever put a dynamite inside of yourself. It doesn't come from you. It's, it's another power that is given to you. So the idea here is it's not our, our power, it's empowerment from God. So the shield of faith is our faith in God that protects us in every battle like a shield protected a first century soldier. You think, man, soaking the shield, lugging that thing around, ah, it's a lot. Well, think about what's at stake here. Just to be clear, these are not decorative little holiday darts with love notes and heart-shaped chocolates attached to them. These are flaming darts straight from the evil one who is seeking to destroy you. Even the sweet little old ladies among us, you, you have an enemy who is seeking to destroy you. So what's our hope? What's our hope? And, and what does it look like when our, our hope is applied in daily life? What's our hope? Well, the shield of faith, when used effectively, can guard us in times of doubt, drought, and despair. 
So for this morning, I'll define doubt as just kind of wondering, is it worth it to obey God? Is it even worth it? And drought or spiritual drought is, is just, man, I'm in this spiritual desert. Why don't I see God at work? So we have doubt and drought, and then maybe you can relate to a time of despair. You're saying, I wonder if God even sees this or knows this. Think how many people in Florida right now are saying, does God even see this? Does God even know? This despair. So certainly these three areas don't cover every possible way that God's enemy might try to destroy you. Uh, but they're general categories that can uh, probably relate to these in some sense. And we'll look at principles here about lifting our shield as we go on today. So there's a variety of reasons that you might paint a wall in your home. Stains, tired of the paint color, cracks, whatever it is. But neither the paint in your home nor the shield of faith is effective until it is applied. So my hope of these examples is to demonstrate that every flaming dart of the evil one really can be extinguished by faith in God's promises. So, beloved of God, may we take up our shield of faith. So, so to take up the shield of faith is to take hold of God's promises in times of doubt, in times of drought, and in times of despair. So, first, God's enemy may shoot... Uh, darts of, dr- of doubt at you to get you to question, is it, is it really worth it to obey God? Is it, really, is it really worth it to try and walk in His ways and be righteous and honor Him? Is it really worth it? I told my dad, I'll never forget standing there in the doorway of my bedroom, I told my dad I was thinking about starting to uh, smoke. I, I said, I, I think I'm going to start smoking, Dad. And I was in seventh grade, and he looked at me and <laughs> What? I, I said, well, Dad, there's these guys, Kurt and, and Chris, in my class. And I know what you and Mom have told me, but, but they don't have cancer. And their teeth aren't falling out. And, Dad, all the girls like these guys. So I'm thinking about starting smoking. <laughs> so he just looked at me and smiled and shook his head. And he, even though my parents warned me about the dangers of smoking, I, I was wondering a lot if it was really worth it to obey. If it was really worth it. I was a time of doubt. My dad responded by putting his hand on my shoulder and saying with a smile, it's just not a good idea, Paul. We were a church-going family, but my dad was a good, honorable man. I I wish he would have known about Psalm 73. Psalm 73. It's this Holy Spirit-inspired poem by a guy named Asaph. So he's surrounded by these arrogant, rebellious people who appeared so prosperous and happy and everything's awesome. And Asaph found himself wondering, man, is it really worth it to obey God? (laughs) If so, why am I trying to keep my heart pure and all these rebellious people seem so content? Can you relate to that? Can you relate to that? Godless, rebellious people around us seem so happy? Well, Asaph reflected on his own bewilderment with these words. Psalm 73, he said, Truly God is good to his people, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me... I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You ever envious of the arrogant when you see the prosperity of the wicked? Well, then in Psalm 73, Asaph goes on to describe how these arrogant people even curse God. But somehow, they appear to be blessed beyond measure. What in the world? So so he wonders then, in verse 13, I think, he says, Is it in vain that I've kept my heart pure? Is it in vain that I'm even bothering to follow God? Then comes the turning point in the psalm. He says, But when I thought to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. So Asaph puts his faith into action by spending time with God and with God's people. That is, he he went into the sanctuary of God and that gave Asaph a right perspective on what he saw happening all around him. And toward the end of the psalm, Asaph confesses that he had been thinking foolishly. And then he writes this, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I don't need that guy's yacht. I don't need to be jealous of this guy's four houses. These people that curse God, God is my strength. God is my refuge. 
He's my portion. He's, he's adequate. He makes me content. God alone makes me content. And that's the only Because you know what? The people who have all the money, they'll never have enough. So that's, that's one example of what it looks like to take up the shield of faith, even though it's the Old Testament. This is what God's people do. Salvation's always been by faith. People take up essentially the, the shield of faith and extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one with God's word. So when you find yourself wondering, is it, is it really worth it to obey God? Is it really worth it to walk in his ways? Take up your shield of faith and extinguish the flaming darts of doubt by spending time with God and spending time with God's people. Well, in addition to the flaming darts of doubt, maybe you've observed that God's enemy shoots darts of drought to get us to question, why, why don't I see God at work? Why don't I see him working around me? Well, sometimes, at least in my life, sometimes spiritual uh, seasons of drought are brought on by spiritual amnesia. You know, you forget who God is. You forget what God has done. You, you forget who you are now in Christ. You forget what a big deal it is that he's rescued you from the fires of hell. You forget what God has promised to do even on this earth. Less spiritual amnesia can bring on a period of spiritual drought. And you start to wonder, why don't I see God at work? Well, Psalm 42 paints a picture of a man crying out to God once he realizes that he's in a season of spiritual drought. He longs for God with these words. He says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Well, Psalm goes on to say that he is surrounded by people who taunt him by saying, oh, well, where is your God? Why isn't, he, why isn't he at work on your behalf? And he's like, I'm starting to wonder that myself. <laughs> I'm in a period of drought right now. But even at the point where he's, he's oppressed, he's taunted by his enemies, the writer takes up a shield of faith and speaks truth into his emotions this way. He says, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Think about this. Nobody talks to you more than you do, right? Nobody talks to you more than you do. So have you ever recognized this season of spiritual drought and then just told yourself, hope in God. Put your hope in God. It's been helpful for me this past week. Quite honestly, I started to get a bit lazy. I realized that I haven't been preaching to myself and speaking truth into my emotions as much as I ought to lately. And you know what? You can. You can. You can take up the shield of faith and guard yourself from times of spiritual drought by speaking God's truth into your emotions. You can say to yourself, put your hope in God. Even while you're brushing your teeth, look at yourself. Put your hope in God. Well, in addition to the flaming darts of doubt and drought, God's enemy shoots darts of despair and gets us to wonder, does God even see my desperate situation? Well, Psalm 86 is written by David, the warrior king, at a time when he made an effort to pursue God, he was obeying him, but he still found himself in absolute despair. Psalm 86 has three sections. In the first section, David cries out to God, Incline your ear, O Lord. Answer me. I'm poor. I'm needy. Preserve my life. Be gracious to me, O Lord. For to you do I cry all the day. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. Remember that? That's an act of faith, isn't it? You answer. I, I'm calling upon you because you answer me. I'm not calling out in vain. So let's not forget that crying out to God is an act of faith. Crying out to God demonstrates that you believe he's able to hear you, he's willing to hear you, and he's powerful enough to help you. Crying out to God is an act of faith. So, so then in the second section of Psalm 86, David then takes his eyes off himself and his own despair, and he stops, taps the pause button, he just starts to worship God. It's glorious. He says, There's none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. How about that? How about in time of despair, you, you tap the pause button and just start worshiping God? Let's do it. <laughs> so this pattern here in Psalm 86 is David starts out by crying to God in a time of despair. 
Then he takes his eyes off himself and his own despair, and he just turns to worship God for who God is and what God has done. Your works are wonderful. Then the third section, David remembers. He remembers God's mercy, God's grace, his love, his faithfulness with these words. You, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me. Be gracious to me. Show me a sign of your favor. And look at this is for his glory. That those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. God, do this for your glory. Work for your glory. So David was in despair. The evil men are, are trying to destroy him. David put his faith into action by crying out to God for help, and then worshiping God, and then reminding himself of God's great goodness to him. How about that for a model of prayer? Cry out to God, worship him, remind yourself of God's great goodness to you in Christ. Well, when we do this in our seasons, seasons of despair, we're taking up the shield of faith. Crying out to God demonstrates your faith that he really is able to hear you, he's willing to hear you, and he's powerful enough and he loves you enough to help you and act on your behalf. Now remember, his ultimate aim is to form the character of Christ in you, not to make you comfortable and happy all the time. So remember that as you pray. But think of other darts of despair. It might come in times of persecution. Flaming darts of persecution could bring despair, but they can always be extinguished by remembering Jesus' words. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How about that to extinguishing the dart of despair during persecution? May God graciously guard our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who at this very moment are being tortured for their faith in Christ. Other darts of despair might come in times of tragedy. Imagine living among the carnage of Hurricane Ian this past week. Just imagine being there. Think, think of a million and a half people without electricity, at the very least. Food and water and wondering where family members were swept away to. Surely God's enemy is attempting to shoot these flaming darts of despair at every Christian across Florida all week long and probably for months to come. But that being said, every Christian in Florida can hold up their shield of faith with Romans chapter 8 written on the front of it and say confidently, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. That's verse 18. Or, you can say, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's verse 28. Or, I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, including Hurricane Ian, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's verses 38 and 39 with a little addition from me. This is how we extinguish the flaming darts of despair with the word of God. May God be merciful to our brothers and sisters in Florida. May he rise up in his church and work so powerfully in this that he's so glorified at how his people come together. It's another dart of despair that I thought of this past week that I know some of you deal with all the time. And I deal with on occasion too. That's the flaming dart that comes in the form of shame. Let's put it in perspective. When we sin, we're guilty. So we confess it. We thank God for his grace to us in Christ. And then we move forward. Guilt is about what we did. But shame is about who you are. Guilt's about what you did. Shame's about who you are. So how do you extinguish that flaming dart of despair? That dart of shame? Take hold of your new identity in Christ. If you're a believer, you were saved by grace through faith. You're so deeply loved by God. Every single sin is forgiven. You're a child of God the Father forever. Reconciled to him through Christ. Reconciled to one another in Christ. You need not ever feel ashamed. You're a brand new person in Christ. 
And I know some of you, even now, even this afternoon, even tomorrow morning, are going to, feel, going to have those dark, flaming darts of despair with shame written on them shooting at you. And you know what? You're part of a church family here. We love each other. Call someone. Pray with someone. Let's be together in this. You don't have to bear that weight alone. These guys with the shields weren't just lone ranger out trying to go at it on the battlefield. We're in this together. So whatever darts are being shot at you, you don't need to bear them alone. So a shield of faith that's firmly rooted in God's word is able to extinguish every single flaming dart of the evil one. Well, we've seen three psalms whose authors essentially picked up the shield of faith during times of doubt and drought and despair. They had knowledge of God, they had personal experience with God that they put to use in those difficult seasons. Think about this. You have a bunch of knowledge about God? You memorize scripture and everything else? Or is that kind of like you had a bunch of unopened cans of paint all over your house? Oh, I hate the color of this wall. This wall's all cracked. Got a couple cans of paint there. <laughs> they don't paint themselves. They don't paint themselves. Unless you apply this knowledge of who God is and what he's done for you in Christ during seasons of doubt and drought and despair or other difficult seasons of life. It's really like setting unopened cans of paint all around your house and wondering why the walls are still the same color. The value of your faith is found in applying it to your daily life. And this matters to you and me. It matters because the wounds from the flaming darts of the evil one, they're not superficial. They're not scratches and bruises. They're deadly. You need the shield of faith. Think about how darts and arrows arrive. Not slow motion. Oh, look at dart. I better, take, I better move. That's not how this works. They arrive suddenly. They arrive quickly. You need to be on the lookout. Your enemy doesn't shoot these at random. He's, he's aiming at specific high-value targets. So what are yours? What are yours? What, what are your most vulnerable flaming darts? Or what are you, Where are you most vulnerable to, to flaming darts of the evil one? Take every shield of faith. You find yourself wondering if it's really worth it to obey God? Take every shield of faith and extinguish those flaming darts with the truth of God's word. You wonder, well, why don't I see God at work? Or, or I wonder, oh, I'm in such despair. I wonder if God even sees me in my desperate situation. Take up the shield of faith. Extinguish those flaming darts. You know where they're coming from. And you know where to run to. Take refuge in God. So Ephesians says that we need each other for this. So speaking often of the glory of God the Father on display in his work to rescue and reconcile us to him through Christ and to one another in Christ. Ephesians speaks often of this. So then being intentional about gathering as God's people, it's a vital means of taking up the shield of faith. We need each other. Hebrews chapter 10 exhorts every believer to stay vitally connected with the church with these words. It says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For, or because, he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another with all the more, or all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we need each other to take up the shield of faith and we, we worship together, we pray together, we serve together, we sing together, we read and discuss God's word together in small group. And earlier, receiving the Lord's Supper together. We do that regularly. helps us take up the shield of faith. So beloved of God, your faith is kind of like a can of paint. And the genuineness and the effectiveness of your faith in Christ will be revealed throughout the spiritual battles of daily life as you apply it. You know, the world can lull us into a spiritual sleep where we, we get pretty casual and inattentive when it comes to holding up this shield of faith. We can tend to let our guard down. Those of us who are drivers, you remember the first few days, you, you pass your driver's test, you're hyper attentive, you got your signal on, and, you know, a certain time, uh, plenty of time before the intersection, you're a defensive driver, you drive as if the instructor's right next to you, you're super attentive, you got the hands of 10 and 2, you got everything going on when you're starting to drive. After a while, I start kind of driving like this. After a while, I think, yeah, nobody's around. I, don't need to, I can just kind of slow down at the stop sign. Oh, I don't need to use a turn signal anymore. It's easy to get casual about all these things. So how are you doing? Take out the shield of faith. Are you intentional? Are you thoughtful about it? Self, to do that? 
May God guard us from becoming casual and inattentive when it comes to holding up the shield of faith. Because this shield of faith can always distinguish every single arrow in every season of life if we use it. So children of God, the shield of faith can guard you in times of doubt and drought and despair. God's Word calls us to take up the shield of faith every single day. Let's wrap our time together with O Church Arise and put this armor on together.